Welcome to part two of Made in the NEC with Tim Capstraw on the NEC Overtime Pod. In part one, we talked to Tim about his time at Wagner as a student athlete, as well as his basketball coaching career. In this podcast, we'll learn how Tim made the transition to broadcasting, and it all starts right now. So let's talk about, you mentioned the, those MSG luncheons. Um, you know, I was working at the NEC before that in, in Division Three, So I, I got to see you sort of on display at the podium for a number of years. And it was a real golden era of um, coaches with personality, let's say. You had, let's go through, you had Dave McGarity at Maris, Nick McCarchuk at Fordham, PJ Carlos at Seton Hall, Fran Fraschilla at Manhattan. You had all these great personalities. But to me, you were always sort of the main event on, on, on these things. Because you had D, D1, you had the uh, Yeshiva coach for Division oh, Three, was hilarious, great. tremendous. Um, you'd get up there and, you know, you your teams weren't very good some years, but it didn't matter because you still brought the energy. Um, your one-liners, you know, I, I went through some of your one-liners. Let me, let me just throw a couple out for the people oh, out wow. here who may not know. Um, uh, you're one of your famous lines. The only thing we have in common with Georgia Tech, Temple, and St. John's is they have McDonald's All Americans, and we eat our pregame meals at McDonald's. That's yeah, a good one. You now I used to see that quote after all the time, and I'm thinking, you know, I used to steal a lot of material, but people actually stole that from me. <laughs> they did. You know what I mean? Like I steal material. I steal material, but I was the original guy that said that. You know, I was very proud of that line. That's a good one. And yeah. then you had one, not all of the games here at Wagner are that full. People call the basketball office and ask what time the game starts. We say, well, what time can you get here? <laughs> I, 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 I think I heard, That's I a, think I stole that one, brother. I think that was, kind of, right. I, I did, I do steal material, but I just kind of, it's not where you take it, it's not where you steal it, it's where you take it to, you know? Right. So your transition to the NEC broadcast booth, um, I remember talking to then Commissioner John I. Marino. I, you know, I think Tim would be a good fit. And I think we, if I recall, I think we originally hired you as a sideline reporter initially. Yeah. And um, then you transitioned to becoming a color analyst. And right off the bat, I mean, you got to work with some real good play-by-play, -play, like Dave Popkin, who's still going strong, yeah, Paul Dottino, Bill Daughtry back in the early days, who was a big MSG um, anchor, who did some of our games. And from the start, you know, you were very, uh, you know, we liked that you were very effortless on the air and your personality, you carried it from speaking in luncheons in front of people to people at home. And it was a nice, it, it seemed like an effortless transition, but I know you worked really hard at it. What, what was your planning like for games back then? No, not, not just for planning. I remember my first game was going to be with Bill Daughtry. So I would practice all the time at home. Every, this is what I always speak when I speak to young people. I say, you want to look like you're a, a natural, but you're not a nat. Nobody's a natural. So you need to practice so hard at home. This is when I'm fired right now. I'm fired from Wagner. I'm going to do, I had, my, my wife reminds me of this. I had a, a, a VHS, you know, a VCR, not uh, with a video equipment. I had video equipment in my room. I would practice reading the newspaper and talking into the camera every day. I would have games playing. You'd have VHS tapes and you put in games and I would practice. Everybody told me, you gotta say why things happen. So I would practice that. I had ordered, cause I didn't know what, uh, uh, this huge wood thing that was a, a teleprompter. So I would practice reading on a teleprompter. I had this, I had this whole room set up and this practice thing going on and worked really hard at it. So that if I got a chance, everybody would say, well, he's a natural because it's hard to go from communicating um, uh, in front of people or just talking to going on camera. It's a weird feeling. So I would try to simulate, even put like uh, things around the camera that I was using that made it look like a TV camera. So we'd get used to the, the develop the comfort. And I, I just want you to know, it didn't come as easy like as people think. You have to work at it. And then as I, and then, you know, I remember doing a few games and, 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 and then asking Bill Daughtry, could I go over to his house? I went to his house in Union, New Jersey and practiced to be ready for the game. But I remember trying 
I remember that I tried too hard in the beginning, you know, like I, I, I just tried to, my, my voice, I would try to do something with my voice. I would try to do something like, and, and, it, and that never works. And you, but you don't know that, you know, and then you, you just hope that you get enough reps and you keep working at it, that you can be uh, sometime comfortable uh, doing this because, you know, it's almost like co- becoming a head coach. You don't know who's going to be good on TV or radio or whatever until they do it. Yeah, uh, you know, you could you could hear think some guy that's really good, uh, funny on uh, uh, or hanging out, a great personality. But it, sometimes it doesn't translate as well to TV. And, and uh, I had worked really hard. I was really fortunate. And again, I got the opportunity because of the Northeast Conference. Well, you know, or very early on, we you know, and we tried to come up with a brainchild of how we could show your personality. So we came up, we devised like two mad scientists holding court with Tim Capstraw. Okay, so let's, for people who are newer fans who don't know what this is, um, you and me worked harder on this than pretty much anything we did in our lives. Yeah, you did, you did. We're we're writing scripts, we're buying props, uh, we're thinking more and more absurd storylines. It's a halftime show where it's you and two players. And essentially every theme of every episode was the same. We'd start serious, then the players would try to make you look bad. And that was the formula and you just ran with it. Would that be an apt description of what Holding Court was about? Uh, yeah, that was the formula. I don't know that we meant to do that, but um, in the beginning, we wanted to bring the person and, and we wanted to make sure that the personality as of the players were, yep. the, were, were, the, were the most important thing. You know, um, uh, and, and, and it's, it's amazing to me that how good that was the key to it that the kids were were really really good and if i could set it up and they could do their thing and then at the end yeah they'd usually crush me and that was really the formula that began i think it began because the first one i did was at wagner and i think uh, a a player named jeff clotter it would be funny if he just destroyed me or something like that (laughs) you know like like i said well you know hey i said i think i said something hey jeff you guys miss me and he kind of looked at me go no you know or something like that (laughs) so that kind of adopted the formula of that this guy's really good at getting crushed he's he's a i'm a natural at being abused by by you and it, it was it was it was fun it was clever. It was great. It was honestly more, but here's the other thing. When it was bad, it was bad too. Let's be honest. Well, oh, we had some stinkers. For oh, sure. we had a couple. Oh, it was <laughs> awful. There were some, when we bombed, we didn't play around, but the, the, the amount of good stuff that we did. And again, when, when, um, when it bombed, it was because I tried too hard. When it was great was when the players owned the broadcast. We got to know things about them, whether they they sang, they communicated, they told us about um, different things. And 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 I, it's funny how how um, thinking about holding court comes up in my brain a lot. You know, like you know when it really comes up all the time. Every time we we uh, the Nets play the Sixers, right? Um, and beads from Cameroon, right? Joel. Right. And- I know where so, you're going. <laughs> remember we sit there this remember we had this thing uh where what was the player uh, from FDU, the real muscular Chris guy. Chris Eckway. Chris Eckway was from Cameroon, and I was talking to him about Cameroon and we, they didn't have basketball courts, and we did this whole thing on support Cameroon <laughs> basketball. Remember, yes. I was trying to lift a weight or you something. You were pumping weights with Kennedy Okafor and Chris Eckway. Yes, yes, <laughs> and Chris Eckway was support Cameroon basketball. And I can't help but think that Joe Alameed <laughs> was probably eight years old at the time, maybe younger, and he, here he was coming up through Cameroon, and, uh, you know, comes up in my brain uh, quite a bit with that. So we had a lot of fun. There was a, you know, you dressed up in your nerdiest outfit and you got coached up by Ray Martin at LIU. If you remember, remember that. that, who would have done that? <laughs> I remember Wearing I your goggles. goggles. Yeah. Yeah. You had goggles. And, shorts and, and then like three years later, we see the same gig on ESPN. Did somebody steal that? <laughs> I think so. Uh, no, you, no. Uh, 
you had a lounge lizard act with Rasan Benton from St. Francis PA. He played the uh, the keyboards and you were just doing your Vegas character. We did that. Really? I, I got to yeah. see that one. I forgot <laughs> that one. And then the annual Valentine's Day poem that you had the players read. Do you remember what the poem was? Uh, yes. Roses are red. Violets are blue. When I dunk, I think of you. And I, I would always start crying, right? Yes. It's beautiful, emotional. I didn't say that. The player would say that. They, they, the players they, would say. They, so they yes, would yes. send it out to somebody. And um, it was so bad, it was good. You know what I mean? That, that would, and then, the because the players got, again, it was about the players being unbelievable. You know, like, like Jarvis Mitchell is this really tremendous AAU women's coach in, in the country right now who's always saying positive things, like really, he's got a, a, tons of followers and all that. He's really an amazing guy. But he, I remember him just crushing me, you know, or, or Diedrich Dye became a really good friend of mine. He's worked my camps. He's an unbelievable teacher in New Jersey. And what a brilliant guy. He playing the guitar and his song had to do with what a horrible coach I was. You know what I mean? Like, that's funny. You know, All right, so let's crazy. let's go through the the uh, our tour de force, the Survivor episode, which actually oh, got us some yeah, yeah. some publicity. Okay, so this is we're going to close out holding court talking about that. So there was planning. Survivor was the hot, really hot show at the time. It's like still on now, but it was like twenty years ago. Survivor was red hot on CBS, and we worked for weeks on a show where before St. Francis Brooklyn Wagner game, we had Greg Nunn of St. Francis. We had Diedrich Dye of Wagner. And then we imported on an off day, Jarvis Mitchell, who you just talked about from FDU, Paul Dottino drove him to the Spiro Center. Uh, we set up their room upstairs. Uh, we lit it with a candle like a uh, survivor. You were dressed like Jeff Probst in your, in your uh, khaki gear and shorts. And we were gonna have, the, the premise was we were gonna have a talent show and we we're gonna vote someone up. We we're gonna vote someone out of there. And uh, Greg Nunn imitated Ron Gagnon as head coach. You know, I love you guys, but you got to understand one thing. We're going to walk out of here with class like St. Francis Terrier should. This is the way I want it to be. Deidre Dye played the guitar, uh, singing about that you were a terrible coach, and that's why you got fired. You're a terrible coach. That's why you got fired. Impressive. And then Jarvis Mitchell rapped with Diedrich Dye throwing a beat down for him while he was rapping. Greg, hit me a beat. Yeah. Now for the MVP, it's the seesaw. Chilling on holding core with Tim Capstar. In the end, again, um, they voted someone off. They all wrote down on a card and held up your name. They voted you off. You stormed out saying, you got to be kidding me. This is my show. I got kicked off my own show. And so it goes. And then the next thing you know is it, it's getting written up. Um, it's the one that people still talk to me about to this day, get a little buzz from it. Um, do you still get asked about that? Or how long did, did that have some legs for you? Yeah, no, it, it, it does now because then people sometimes, you know, Google or something you, you know, and then they start like, like for a while with the Brooklyn Nets, you know, I was like, you know, I'm trying to like, just be this professional guy, kind of get, do my thing, trying to, I'm like, God, you know, I don't know if they know I'm nuts, you know, like, I don't know if they know, like, I don't, you know, I think they, they're they getting to know who I am, but um, that I would do these things sometimes uh, for the Yes Network, you know what I mean? And I would be pretty good on camera, you know, like before the game. And I think to myself, they have no idea, you know, like, <laughs> Because again, much like the luncheon of New York, I would go to do, say, a broadcast of game Wagner after you at Wagner. I was way more worried about the halftime show because we'd have to film that. The game was nothing. It was the stress of two minutes and, and uh, being able to do that. And, and it's just, you know, it's also funny when I go to the different arenas now, they have all the same like behind the scenes guys that work in the truck. And that's what they all talk about. That was like their favorite thing. You know, like they couldn't believe that we were doing this and uh, it was working. And remember, a part of it was to fill up 
uh, halftime slot. Yeah, and, yeah. and again, to show the kid's personality. And again, sometimes it didn't come off great. But most of the time we took a chance and the kids looked really, really good. And we found out things and kids were able to, you know, the different kids that could, that could sing, that could, you know, uh, yep. do their own highlights, do what, whatever. I thought it was really clever. I, I thought it was, you know, I also think it ended, it ended probably a couple of years too late too. You know what I mean? We probably, <laughs> we probably jumped the shark. We had a good run, you know? But, you know, we got, we renewed we, it for a couple extra yeah, years, we but you could have, <laughs> we probably, yes, we jumped the shark. Uh, probably we had a good, we had a good two, two, three year run where it was outstanding. The beginning, maybe a little, then we, we struck gold for a little while. Then again, we hung on. I think we, I think we might've tried it too, a little too long. You know, <laughs> we, what do you do? Great movie. Yeah. Gotta out, you know, got to get out. Look, early. What I remember a lot about that to close it out was that it got to the point where the players themselves were requesting to be on it because they wanted to get it. There was no social media at the time. Like this was really how like people, their friends would get to see them get to be on the show. They get to be funny. And like you said, Kevin Owens would come on and we have him as a recurring character from Mammoth to announce his own highlights, you know, right. and we find a player that was willing to like, throw themselves out there and have fun. And we're like, well, we got to bring them back. We got to bring them back. So, um, you know, when we hit the apex with Survivor and a packed room full of people watching at Wagner, it, there was like tension. And when we finished it in one take, I just remember like how happy we were because we knew we hit a home run that night. And yeah, I think, I think we went on a little too long, but when it was good, it was great. And it was, um, it was so much fun to be a part of. So yeah, Survivor I, was like Survivor. I mean, you put that up, you know, like if they had like uh, basketball halftime, you know, that would be your Emmy reel right there. That would be the one you'd be putting in to try to get like it was creative. It was funny, and the, and again, the players made it. They the nailed players it. made it. You know what I mean? Like yeah, yep. and, and you could tell that they were enjoying it. But you're right. The part of it that would bring their energy sometimes would be that they were crushing me. And that would be, that was really a good formula. That be kind of, that kind of evolved, but uh, you know, I, I just, that was amazing. We used to have fun trying to put it together and you were like this producer and said, all right, this is what we're going to do this week. You're doing this. Oh, come on, Ron. And then by the end of it, we'd get totally into it. You know, it, it was great stuff. Yep. So Let's move, let's transition back to hoops. Let's talk about some of the, um, the players and games in the NEC through the years that you've been um, able to watch and, and see these players. Let's talk a little bit about Terrence Bailey, player of Wagner from the mid eighties, one of the greatest, a, a, an inaugural NEC Hall of Famer, the NEC's all time leading scorer, averaged almost 30 points a game, two straight years. He was a Wagner player in the mid eighties. So you were very familiar with him. I, I want to, now that I have you on, I want you to tell the story about the Terrence Bailey dunk that you've told me, but I think it would be great to get out there to any C-Hoops fans. No, well, understand that I've, you know, now that I've been in the NBA for 18 years, right? 18 years. And, and people always say, well, you know, what's the best, greatest dunk you ever saw? And they're like, no, nah, well, I'll be honest with you. I think it was like 1983 or something, 84. Terrence ba Terrence Bailey dunking over Rick Smiths. Another Hall of Famer, NEC Hall of Famer. NEC Hall of Famer, maybe 10 plus years pro, maybe an all-star in the NBA, seven foot four, Rick Smith. Now, the only thing I can tell people to compare it to <coughs> is think of Vince Carter dunking over Frederick Weiss in the Olympics. But make Vince Carter four or five inches shorter and make Frederick Weiss two or three inches taller <laughs> and make the height of the dunk higher than that. Like, talk about dunking over somebody. I had never seen it. It was a single, it was a, like a broken play, much like the Vince Carter play. If the ball ends up, this is at Marist. It ends up at half court. I have seen Bailey crush dunks like I've never seen a player and still haven't. There was nobody that dunked like him in the NBA right now. I, maybe Aaron Gordon does one when he did those things, those tricks. But as far as force of a 6'1 player dunking the ball, he, Terrence Bailey would dunk 
Go full tilt, dunk the ball, and immediately go into a tuck position because his head would hit the backboard if he didn't. That's hard to do. And then I meant like that's scary, right? So, anyways, loose ball, half court. He's coming in, the other guy back is Rick Smith. So you're saying, no, no way will he try this, will he? And I don't know if I said no way, because you got to kind of know Bailey at the time. He probably, and he just went up. And I'm not just telling you he went over him. He went like, his body was way above him, like way above everything. And I'd say he hurtled the seven foot guy, but I'm telling you like, his his legs were above the show and he just crushed it on him. It was the most amazing dunk I'd ever seen. I've been privileged to be, you know, in the NBA an awful lot. You see Vince Carter make these things. You do it. There's some spectacular things. But when you take in degree of difficulty, the activity of a game, the force with which it happened, it was it was amazing. He was an incredibly talented player. And um what a dunker. I remember when he'd go in high school. He'd go to his high school game. And if he got the ball in the half court area, the whole place would stand up waiting for it. Right. And and he would go for, he would try to go from like the foul line and almost like dunk it almost from the and just crush it. I remember watching uh, going to a, a summer league game at a park down in Trenton. He dunked it from the foul line and put the game ended. They just cut the, the game just stopped. We're not playing anymore. Everybody went home. It was uh, it was hysterical because he he was that dramatic and, and 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 talented and had an edge to him that he would go for these dunks was amazing. Terrence Bailey, one of the NEC greats. Are there any other like, players along the way that when you think about NEC hoops come to mind for you as special? Oh, I, I it just goes on and on and on. I, I you know at. at trying to think who my favorite give me your all-time people and i just like to talk about them give me give me the guys that, that, that like say your first who's been inducted in the hall of fame so far let me just think it out uh let's see i mean corsley edwards yes from yes. central well, connecticut yeah he was an anchor right remember him just just owning it um, that's a good one i mean then you have all the these Robert Morris and LIU guys the LIU three-peat team with Elasawir and Boyd and Brickman and Velton Jones right. um you know, yeah, that's go, yeah. see, my thing is I go back so early that I didn't know if I'm if I'm talking about guys that, you know, Charles Jones, Myron Walker, Myron Walker, right, and, and, Robert and Morris, Robert Morris. Um, uh, FDU had a run of guys like Desi, Desi Wilson, Damari yeah. Riddick, um, Elijah Allen. Elijah Allen had 40 or 44 in the NCAA tournament against UConn and they were hanging with UConn. One of Tom Green's team. Talk about an NEC performance in the NCAA tournament. Elijah Allen had that. If I just go through the teams, I, I, it's easy. It's almost easier. Charles Jones. Me. Charles Jones at LIU was ridiculous. But even prior to him, there's a general player named Robert Cole when I was in school. There was a player named, it might have been right before the Northeast Conference, which is amazing. I don't, you can't be in the Northeast Conference longer than I've been in the Northeast Conference, by True. the way, right? Because I've been True. there since, since it was original, it originated, and, I, and now I'm still hanging around. You still give me a few games every year. <laughs> I, 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 listen, the amount of players uh, is, is ridiculous, but probably at Wagner, a Bailey, uh, you know, but then you go to Jermaine Hall and you go to those guys right. too. But then along the way, um, you know, and even even Ryder won those two years. You know, Suber was great. Charles Super. Smith, Deion yeah. Ames. Yeah, these teams were good. You know, these yeah. teams. What were good. Mount, Mount Saint Mary's? Uh, they're they're the slew of guards that Jim Phelan had. You know, think about Chris that. Chris McGuthrie. Chris Mc. Talk about a coach, Chris McGuthrie, Kevin Booth, even before that. Yep. Uh, they always had great guards, and I remember like. Jim Phelan, talk about being ahead of your time. You know, talk about having like unbelievable coaches. Jim Phelan would talk to me about, you know, you got to get yourself a lot of guards and you got to let them shoot. You got to let them shoot from far. And I'm saying to myself, well, that's pretty much what the NBA does every game right now. Yes. You know what I mean? That's kind of what everybody's adopted uh, 30 years later or 20 years later was exactly what Jim Phelan was coaching at Mount St. Mary's for how many years he was there. What, what a yep. brilliant man way ahead of his time. 
So before we wrap up um, with your post, you know, your outside the NEC life now, um, what would you, what makes NEC basketball so special to you? Oh, first of all, it's like we said in the beginning, where you choose to go to college is life changing. It's the biggest decision of your life. Everything changes from that. Everything changes and everything grows from where you decide to go to college. Northeast Conference sports, I think, are the perfect blend of student athlete. And you get this one special ingredient that you might not get everywhere else. The student body that attends your games are your friends, are people you know. The schools aren't so big that you don't, the people cheering for you aren't people you don't know. There's a familiarity about it. There is a beauty about it. There's a challenge. And once you're in your league, it, it, nothing else matters. You know what I mean? I think it's brilliant how the NCAA tournament is actually set up. Because yes, you have this 300 something teams, but really it's only the 12 or so that you are competing with at that time that matter. And you just kind of get to know your team. You get to know your league. You're so focused on these different things that uh, it's terrific. And I also think it's grown uh, immensely since the period of time that I've I've been able to watch the whole evolution of the Northeast Conference. It's gone from a lot of a lot of more a lot of ugly gyms in the beginning to beautiful facilities, much like the you know the entire country has with. But the Northeast Conference has done a wonderful job with the facilities. Uh, the amount of uh, media coverage, whether we're talking about being on, you know, you know, maybe regional television, but look at what you do as far as social media right now, as far as uh, front row where every game can be watched, basically every game of every sport. Man. Uh, the evolution of this has, has been great, but I just think Northeast Conference is special in that it, it's it's it it, it, it there, there's a there's a uniqueness to it that brings it so close that you're close to your your your, your friends in the school, you're close to in, in your environment of the games, the games, the fans are closer to you. The uh, going for the tournament championships are at home site. Uh, we talked about that earlier. Listen, I, I, I think it's, it's, it's great. It's perfect. I haven't, I've never heard many complaints about anybody that's ever gone through the Northeast Conference. That's, a, that's the commercial you just did for us that you used to have the players do for their own schools when we were doing holding court. So oh, really? That. Yeah, that's right. Because <laughs> no, think about it. You know, I mean, look at this. You know, I, I was a walk-on at Wagner College. A walk-on. You know, you know how many points I need to go to get – to a thousand in my career in basketball? <laughs> How many? 980. <laughs> 900. Let me go through every basket I made. I'll go First one, a baseline eight footer against Pace University, okay? I lit up, it was 12 minutes, 12 seconds on the clock. At the end of the game, we're up 25. I go through every basket if you want. So you think about what, no, what's being a, it's always a walk on. Worst player on the team. PJ Carlissimo used to say to me, You crawled on. You didn't walk on. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> so, and, and so you think about what opportunities give you because you're a Northeast Conference athlete. Well, I wasn't good, but I was a hardworking student. I was a student athlete. I, I, I was able to get my foot in the door coaching. And then because I, I got my foot in the door coaching at Wagner, I then get to go uh, up to another school. Then I come back and because of people who liked the job I was doing, um, gave me an opportunity as a person who did, scored 20 career points was a head coach. Uh, there are op- the opportunities and the advantages and the difference between being a division one athlete and a regular college student, I think is so really significant. And these guys, these athletes that go through day to day um training working out weightlifting study hall they are really prepared for life after college that's what i thought it prepared me for because i wasn't good but i had to go to practice every day 
You know what I mean? Like I had to go and I had to guard people and I would guard like something, you know, I would like be a random player. So I'd be like, Timmy, you got to play defense on uh, Howard Tompkins. Right. But Howard's elbows were at the head of my, I'd be hitting the head all the, all the time, you know? And I remember I had to be Ralph Sampson one day in practice. I ran <laughs> up and down. We were playing Ralph Sampson. He got, PJ Carlissimo gave me a broom to run up and down the floor with. <laughs> I was playing as Ralph Sampson. There are opportunities that um, come along because you're a student athlete in the Northeast Conference that you have no idea what your future could be. I had no idea. My dream at six years old was to be a basketball, in basketball somehow. I'm now, I went from six, I'm now 60. And it's just still, I'm in my dream right now. Maybe it didn't, it isn't exactly how I thought it. Probably thought I was going to be a player. Probably thought I was going to be a coach. Now, I, now I'm a broadcaster and I get, I'm still living the same thing at, at 60 that I dreamed about when I was six years old. That, that's well, what can happen for Northeast Conference athletes. Look, the path, it's often, uh, it's almost never a linear path to get where you want to go. So there's going to be some ups and downs. Um, and where you say you are now at 60 as a longtime Nets radio analyst, you know, you were tapped for that position only a couple of years into your, your NEC tenure. You were a relatively young broadcaster. And then in 2002, when the Nets were one of the best teams and going to the champion and going to the finals with Jason Kidd, you are, find yourself sort of thrust into their radio um, position as, the, as their analyst working with the great Chris Carino, who you're, you're still with. Um, how did that, how did that happen? How did you get that position? And, and what was your thoughts at the time? No, no, uh, luck, you know, luck is, uh, you know, when, when preparation meets opportunity, right? That, that is the whole thing because I, I really believe that, you know, when I was starting off in coaching, I got really lucky in recruiting because I outworked everybody. I got really lucky in broadcasting because I was working so hard and, and trying to be good and trying to take every opportunity I could and, and volunteering everywhere I possibly could to get better. And because of that, I got lucky. That's what it meant. It meant that I got lucky. I, I, I had given myself enough, enough repetitions that I had had uh, a highlight reel. And that's because the Northeast Conference. The Northeast Conference gave me, gave me enough games for a few years that I had something. Because without that reel, it wasn't even a reel. It wasn't a link back then. It was a VHS. Without yeah. that, you were nothing. So you wanted to get, you guys gave me the chance to get me in the door that would to be lucky. And what happened was just a rare opportunity where they made an adjustment in their, in their TV crew, where a, a great player named Kelly Chapuka moved from radio to TV. Chris Carino had been on, was a different year for him in the summer. He was getting, actually going on a honeymoon. He thought Lou Lamarillo was going to take care of everything. He was the head of the Nets then. And different people were calling him about the job and uh, things were going up. He, didn't, he was worried about the devils, you know, and the nets. He didn't wasn't worried about the radio. Bro. So it kind of were like three weeks out. And then you're working hard because I'm going out training people out in um, Long Island. And lo and behold, Mike Breen's son is one of the kids I'm training. Jack Armstrong got approached about the, about the job and said, listen, I don't want the job, but I got the guy for you. He was with the Toronto Raptors at the time, former Niagara coach. But I got the guy for you. Have you ever heard uh, Tim Capstraw broadcast the game? I heard him do a game in the Northeast Conference. That guy, he could be good. He could be good. Give him some time. He's got to learn the league. He's got to learn, but he could be good. Plus, he's fun to hang out with. You know, like you got to travel. You know <laughs> what right. I mean? He's not, he, you like going to lunch. You know what I mean? Like you got to be kind of fun to hang out with. So, that, that's kind of, I, I forgot the question. I got all jacked up, Rod, but. but. <laughs> well, how about, is there a, like a favorite moment then of your time of your whatever, 18 years now or so with the Nets, favorite moment or game that sticks out in your mind? Yeah, yeah. Um, game seven at, in Toronto, it was the final call of the game. It was the final call. And I had learned this because I think when you're a good broadcaster, when you work with Dave Popkin, Paul Patino, you got to be a good teammate, you know. You got to be a good teammate. We're on the floor, and it was um, 
the Raptors, we, I think, and, and Kyle Lauer is making a play at the end of the game. And um, Paul Pierce rejected the shot. But when you're on the floor, oftentimes Chris Carino gets blocked. You know what I mean? And all the broadcasters get blocked and they, they're not really sure what to do. And Chris Carino, this is the game seven call. He's saying rejected, reject. He knew it was rejected. So, but my favorite thing that I've ever done in broadcasting was I never said anything and I wrote on a piece of paper, Pierce. So he's saying rejected, rejected, rejected. I write down Pierce and he goes, Paul Pierce rejected the shot. That's my favorite thing I've ever done. And it wasn't a word. It was something that I knew enough to stay out of the way and to help be a good teammate. And Chris Carino, that was our favorite call. And a lot went into uh, that. And it had nothing. And I could see it. And he couldn't. And uh, that's kind of what makes a good broadcast. I think that's why we're good. That's why I think I'm good with Dave Popkin. I'm good with Paul. If there's a chemistry, we want each other to be good. That means the broadcast becomes good. Awesome. Great story. So before we wrap up, um, you know, your, your wife, uh, Chelsea played at Ryder and now your daughter, Kylie is a junior at West Orange high school. Really good, really good, terrific player. You know, you and me have talked over the years about youth sports as we watched our, you know, you watch your children grow up and playing them. Um, how cool is it for you to see your daughter playing the game that you love and she loves and she's succeeding at? How rewarding is that for you as a, as a self-professed basketball guy for 60 years? No, no, it's amazing. I always tell people, you know, that they say, well, what is it like being a coach? I go, well, it's not as good as going out in the backyard and kicking a soccer ball with your kid. It's, it's, that's the best coaching you ever do or teaching your, kid, your, your child how to swing a bat or shooting a basketball. It might not seem like it to them, like that you might be annoying to them. I'm, I'm very annoying to my daughter, but, <laughs> but to you, it's the most beautiful coaching you'll ever do. For, so for a parent, and it just doesn't have to be sports, when you spend time with your child and see progress, it is an amazing feeling or watching them play and uh, play well. And uh, I love watching my daughter play. I will say this though, that I, I, she's incredibly highly motivated herself. So she's got people assume that I did a lot with her. First of all, I haven't, she's done it a lot herself and um, other people have been really involved. It's hard to, it's nice to coach your child sometimes, but it's hard to do it too. And you can't necessarily coach them the same way. But when you sometimes connect with them and it's good, now it doesn't happen that often with me. It's not like I can go out on the floor. I have to like, if I don't choose the right word or I don't shut up, it's an ugly scene sometimes because it's just hard with your parents. But you're right. It, it's a beautiful, uh, it's a beautiful feeling. Uh, I'm proud of it. Um, and she's, she's a really good, great kid. And that's why this stuff is fresh in my mind right now. I'm trying to, you know, uh, about colleges and stuff like this. It's a weird time for young players right now, whether it be in college or high school, you just, things are moving along quick in high school, but it doesn't, it hadn't had the same rhythm, right? You used to play your season, maybe play a, a travel of AU, then you get another season. You don't even, it's all kind of meshed in right now. And um, it, it's, it's a weird time. So you're trying to, trying to find your way through it. But I, I'm like yourself, watching your son play soccer or, or, or watching, or any, 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 any parent, or anybody watching young people play, it's it doesn't get any better than that. And yet you don't want to be that parent that you might you got to just practice be holding it in, you know, like you care a lot, but you can't act like you care that much. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> I know what you mean. But but inside you don't want to be that parent, you know. And a couple of times, I've, I I I was a little bit that parent, and I totally regretted it. And and uh, you know my daughter. She'll let me know too. Just shut up, you know. Just, just. just right. <laughs> it's great. You treasure the time because it, it does it does go quick. Um, let's last question for you. In last um, 2019 NEC Media Day at Barclays Center. You did a great job addressing our uh, men's and women's uh, basketball student athletes. Uh, great message. It's been a rough year for them. It's been a rough year for everyone in 2020 trying to stay positive and now get back on the court still in the midst of a pandemic. 
Um, what would be your message to NEC student athletes at this time as they as they prepare for their for the 2020-21 season? No, no, I think sometimes when you're around other student athletes, you forget how special you are because everybody's a, a student athlete, right? But most of the time, if you're a basketball player, you're a football player, you're in the, I don't know, it could be the 1% club, right? The 1% club that gets to go to college to, to play, right? Or the maybe it's 3%, but you get the point. Don't forget how special you are as a student athlete, don't forget, just because you, you happen to be around other ones, so you don't, you're forgetting. But remember, there were hundreds, hundreds of, you, of young people in grammar school, in high school that wanted to be you, that wanna be in your position. Do not forget that. But the reason why you are able to be this good of an athlete is because you were self-motivated. And that's what you have to be maybe a lot of times right now is continue to be self-motivated and understand that inside with you, you can outwork people. Uh, and, and that's the advantage you gain through sports. You learn how to work hard, uh, work on your own, train yourself. Yes, you have coaches, but be, be that inner person and, and, and remember how special your situation is that you are in college right now and you are a student athlete. Fight through it. Much like you hear the words resiliency, adversity, and all that stuff with your coaches, this is your life that you have to be resilient with right now. You have to face adversity. And again, I believe that you will, because again, you're in that club, man. You made that club. You made that 3%, that 2%, that 1% club that worked hard enough, worked long enough, and stuck with it to get yourself to the Northeast Conference. So keep doing what you've been doing and don't lose that type of focus. That's, that's a, it's a tremendous message right there, ladies and gentlemen. This was Tim Capstraw, uh, certainly born and bred, and as we say now, made in the NEC. 40 year history for Tim in the conference as we celebrate our 40th anniversary. Yeah, I got mileage, man, holy cow. <laughs> <laughs> Once again, former NEC student athlete, coach, and longtime analyst, Tim Capstraw. He's made in the NEC, and he's joined us on today's NEC Overtime podcast. Thanks.